Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar Talks. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Xiaoying Ma, a tobacco control researcher and postdoctoral fellow at The Ohio State University. Talks is being organized by Catherine McLean from Temple University, Mike Pasco from Georgia State University, Si Xiang from The Ohio State University, and Justin White from the University of California, San Francisco. The seminar will be one hour with questions asked by the moderator and discussant. The audience may post questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable, for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments meeting seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with presentation slides on the top's website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Justin White from UCSF to introduce our speaker. Thanks. Today we conclude our fall 2021 season with a single paper presentation by Dr. Abigail Friedman entitled Intended and Unintended Effects of E-Cigarette Taxes on Youth Tobacco Use. Dr. Friedman is an Associate Professor of Health Policy at the Yale School of Public Health. Her research focuses on the policy determinants of tobacco use and the disparities therein, with the overarching goal of informing and facilitating evidence-based policymaking to improve population health and reduce inequality. A health economist by training, she uses quasi-experimental approaches, um, that is quantitative methods that can produce a causal effect absent randomized assignment to estimate the effects of federal, state, and local policies on smoking and vaping, and to clarify the, the drivers of socioeconomic and mental health disparities in tobacco use. Her research has been funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, as well as the US National Institutes of Health and US FD, uh, Food and Drug Administration, and covered broadly in the media, including in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Philadelphia Inquirer, among other outlets. Dr. Mike Pesco from Georgia State University is a co-author of the paper and will assist in answering select questions in the Q&A. Our discussant today is Dr. C. Shang. Dr. Friedman will present her research in two segments and we'll have a pause after each segment to allow for questions. Dr. Friedman, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you for having me. Can you see my slides? Yes, yeah, looks good. Wonderful, always a first check. So thank you for having me, everyone. I'm going to be presenting work today on the relationship between electronic nicotine delivery system taxes and youth tobacco use. But before I dive in, I want to recognize my fantastic set of co-authors, Rahi, Chuck, Double, Bo, Catherine, Mike, Joe, and Sam. It's been great working with you. I hope we'll keep doing it. But I also wanna note that this is alphabetic in terms of the order of the co-authorship because it really was a team effort. So you're seeing me talking here, but I am not the only one behind this. Um, it's been a wonderful collaboration. Quick acknowledgements and disclosures. We don't have any conflict of interest on this team. This work was funded both by grants from the National Institute on Drug Abuse of the National Institutes of Health, and in my case, on funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. The views expressed here are those of the authors. They do not necessarily reflect the views of our funders or our institutions. Quick overview. I wanna start off by giving some context on the general public health conundrums involved in thinking about policies for electronic nicotine delivery devices or ENDS, and then describe the background literature and particularly the quasi-experimental background literature in this space before diving into our research questions, data, methods, findings, et cetera. To set the stage, a wide array of literature suggests that ENDS are substantially less dangerous than combustible cigarettes. This was concluded in distinct 2018 reports by the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine in the US and Public Health England in the UK. And as smoking, that is combustible tobacco use, has been the leading cause of preventable mortality for half a century, it also behooves me at the same time to note that being less dangerous than smoking is not a particularly high bar. So the important question here is how much less dangerous is vaping nicotine than smoking cigarettes? Alcott and Rafkin surveyed 137 experts in August of 2020. 
and found that the average expert believed that nicotine vaping's effect on quality adjusted life years was about 37% that of smoking. So around or under two fifths the effect. And what's interesting about this is that that statistic actually tracks with a number of other studies, including work on biomarkers comparing exclusive smokers and exclusive, exclusive vapors on respiratory outcomes among smokers who do versus don't switch to electronic nicotine delivery systems, on vascular function one month after switching, and on changes in carcinogen and toxicant exposure. So what this tells us is that in practice, the impact of vaping or ENDS policies on population health is going to depend heavily on how it affects smoking, specifically the degree to which people who otherwise would have smoked switch completely to vaping and the degree to which people who would not have used tobacco start using it as a result of this option. So both directions, right? Consequently, to promote population health, policymakers have to factor in the effect of potential ENDS policies on combustible tobacco product use. Now, with respect to this question of whether or not having vaping on the market is leading people who would not otherwise have smoked to smoke, I wanna show you a figure that's actually not from this paper. This is National Youth Tobacco Survey data, so nationally representative data on high school students in the US from 2011 to 2020. And I'm starting in 2011 because even though e-cigarettes technically entered the US market in 2006, due to court cases and FDA action, it wasn't clear that use of e-cigarettes was going to be broadly available until a court decision in December 2010 in Soterra, the FDA. And if you look at sales, it's after that point that we start seeing rising use and sales of e-cigarettes in the US. So if we look at 2011 to 2020, what you see here, the top line is the proportion of high school students who are reporting any past 30 day use of any tobacco product. And the number for 2011 right here is actually slightly higher than the number for 2020. So what you see looking at this, you should notice two things. The red and orange colors are combustible products. And what we see is that combustible product use is going down overall and also as a share of tobacco use among youth over this period. And yes, use of ends is going up. But it's not entirely clear, and it really does depend to a great extent what we think was going on in 2019, whether this is a trend or a blip. It's not entirely clear that the overall share of youths who are using tobacco products changed in that period. So trying to understand what's going on with youth use and their movement between the products is going to matter a lot, especially if what we think is happening is that youth are reallocating their choices between product types, not necessarily moving from the would never have used to using category. The growing evidence base we have using quasi-experimental research methods, that is approaches that can give us a causal estimate without randomized assignment to assess the relationship between vaping and smoking really starts from the literature on minimum legal sales ages for ENDS. And that evidence broadly seems to conclude that electronic nicotine delivery systems and combustible cigarettes are substitutes. For those of you who are not economists, an economic substitute refers to a product where if the price of product A increases, consumption of product B increases. So concretely, if Coke gets more expensive, people buy more Pepsi. A complement is a product where if one product gets more expensive, you buy less of the other product. So if tennis rackets get really expensive, maybe people buy less tennis balls, right? So when we're asking the question here, looking at minimum legal sales ages, we're not using money in the price sense, but we're thinking about ease of access. So what we found in these studies are that largely most of the time when we looked at data sets on youth as states adopted a limit on the age at which you could purchase e-cigarettes, those states saw relative increases in the trends in youth use of combustible products as compared to states that didn't adopt these policies. And the one exception of and Adams finds evidence of complementarity for 12th graders, but in this meta-analysis you see here, overall it bears out the substitutes hypothesis. Now, two things to note. One, MLSAs were brought on in all states in the US as of 2016. So we're talking about pre-2016 variation, right? This is a different period. The average e-cigarette product on the market in 2012 doesn't look like the average one today. So let's look for some more evidence. This is our first bulk evidence that substitution might be happening. The next set of evidence we have, which is less well-developed, looks at vaping restrictions. So Cooper and Pesco connected indoor vaping restrictions to increased prenatal smoking. 
And work of myself, John Oliver and Susan Bush also found suggestive evidence that vape-free worksite restrictions actually increased smoking relative to having just the smoke-free worksite with no vaping restriction for 18 to 25 year olds. That is a much more dated literature, so still developing. Also, some of the early ENDS advertising work by Dave et al. suggests that ENDS advertising that is making people more aware or more salient, um, making ENDS more salient, is associated with increases in adult smoking cessation. So both of these points also point to substitution. Getting a little closer to what we're talking about here, and one of the very much growing areas of evidence looks at taxes. And this is the classic way that an economist would test for substitution. When the price goes up because of a policy change, not because of consumer behavior, do people consume more or less of the other good? And broadly, what we're seeing from this evidence base is that taxes on electronic nicotine delivery systems are associated with less vaping and more smoking among adults. The first um, site here is a synthetic control. So they're comparing specifically Minnesota's ENDS tax, which was the first in 2010 and was also much larger than many of them even that are on the, um, that are in effect today. And what's safer at all found is that the ENDS tax in Minnesota was linked to greater smoking and less smoking cessation among adults. Cotty et al. used Nielsen retail scanner data, which is has one advantage over Safer et al. in that they're looking at lots and lots of tax changes, not just in one location. But of course, we don't know who the people are in the household exactly who buy them. They also find evidence of positive cross-price elasticities. That is, when the price of ends goes up, we see more consumption of cigarettes and vice versa. Alcott and Rafkin's results were subject to the actual specification they used, but note they're using the national, excuse me, the Nielsen retail scanner data also. They just have a shorter subset of it than the Cotty et al. And then if we dig into the individual data, looking at respondents, we have Pesco et al.'s paper, which estimated ENDS taxes effects on adult smoking and vaping using two of the large health surveys that we think of as nationally representative good data on tobacco among other health behaviors and outcomes. The Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, which is actually identified as representative at the state level as well as nationally, and the National Health Interview Survey. Their effects are consistent with the prior ones. We're seeing that higher ends taxes reduce daily vaping and increase daily smoking, and higher conventional cigarette taxes reduce daily smoking and increase daily vaping, all right? Particularly for people under age 40. Abuk et al. also see this pattern looking at prenatal smoking and vaping, which is particularly concerning because then you're talking also about the developmental effects on the fetus. The literature for taxes and youth is more nascent. And I wanna note that I'm not writing or not showing you every paper on ENDS taxes. There are a number of papers where they only look at the relationship between taxes and ENDS use simultaneously. So you can't establish directionality. You don't know whether the tax came first or the use came first or where they're looking at particularly Massachusetts's ENDS tax, where it was implemented simultaneously with a flavor ban. So disentangling the policies is fairly difficult. And we're not gonna talk about ENDS taxes effects on vaping if they didn't look at smoking. What that leaves us with are two papers that I think are very much worth mentioning. Anderson, Matsuzawa, and Sabia are exemplifying a set of papers that used binary indicators for ENDS taxes. And the reason they're doing this is that the early taxes had different structures. Some states were percent of cost, some states were per milliliter. And so what they do instead is they say, okay, let's look at the states that did adopt and just the choice of adoption, the change in vaping and smoking when you go from not having it to having it, excuse me, not having an ENDS tax to having an ENDS tax versus those who didn't change their policy. In those cases, they found that the adoption of the tax reduced ENDS use, both daily and current, but the effects for conventional cigarettes were imprecise, which kind of makes sense, right? They've only got two years of data. They've got a very broad brush instrument of adoption or not, not distinguishing the levels. So they still find something, but we can't be sure. If you go to PESCO and Warman, we have a different kind of approach. They're using the National Youth Tobacco Survey data for 2011 to 2015. And they start by matching that to scanner data on pricing. So they can look at the relationship between prices for e-cigarettes and the area that the youth were in and youth behavior, but then they do a sensitivity check using Minnesota's tax and find that a 100% ends ad valorem tax increase would yield a three pack per month increase in cigarettes smoked by youth smokers, which is very concerning. 
Now, the ideal case here would be a step further, which would use data on taxes nationwide. If you're looking at this period 2011 to 2015, they really only had the option of Minnesota because of the timeline of e-cigarette tax adoption. So what we're going to do is take that next step. Our research asks how ends taxes affect youth cigarette smoking, both participation and intensity of use, ends vaping, both participation and intensity of use, the perceived likelihood that regular ends use is highly risky, and the primary source for ends for youth. And by youth, we mean largely high school age, in one case, eighth graders also. So we're talking primarily about minors. And as such, this research provides perhaps the most comprehensive picture to date of the relationship between ends taxes and youth tobacco use. We pulled two different youth survey data sets here. First, monitoring the future is a nationally representative sample of eighth, 10th, and 12th grade students in middle and high schools in the contiguous US. They're interviewing about 45K, 45,000 youth annually. And they've got long standing tobacco use questions. The ends questions were added in 2014. They also have the perceived risk question that we care about. The other survey we're going to pull is the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance System. And actually we took both the state identified YRBS surveys, the ones run by the state and the national one and pulled those data. That looks at high school students in public and private schools across the US and has longstanding smoking questions as well. They added ends questions in 2015, as well as source questions. The disadvantage for Yarvis is it's only every other year. We matched these data to information on ends taxes. And in particular, one of the key problems when you're studying taxes on electronic nicotine delivery systems is how in the world you're going to compare across states that have very different tax structures. Because we see states with per milliliter, per unit taxes, percent of wholesale costs, percent of retail costs, or even combinations. So we here are going to use the results of an excellent paper by Cotty et al. that just went online this week in tobacco control on standardizing the measurement of e-cigarette taxes. The basic approach that they do is they pull data on prices from the Nielsen retail scanner data and they match it to UPCs and identify the number of fluid milliliters in each product. Then they look at the states that don't have taxes on ends and estimate the markup for the price given they have the retail, or excuse me, they take the markup from documents that they have from purchasing information and they use that along with the price data from Nielsen and the milliliters to back out wholesale and retail price per milliliter in those states. They then show that there's not much geographic variation in ends pricing between states consistent with a national market. And then they can use that fact to back out the tax per milliliter equivalent in the states that do have a tax based on those tax rates, milliliters, and the average prices. We're using that approach to identify our taxes. Now, also just so everyone understands the variation, this top map here are ends taxes at the first quarter of 2019. The bottom map is first quarter of 2020. I mentioned this earlier, but the reason I put this up there here is twofold. First, I want you to recognize that the number of states with taxes doubled after 2019. All right. So we're not actually able to take advantage of 2020 data here, but this is changing rapidly. However, when we do look at the 2019 data, we see that there is at least one state in every census region that has a tax and the variation in the size is broad. So for example, in North Carolina, Louisiana, we're looking at taxes that are under 25 cents per milliliter. California's is over $1.50 per milliliter and Minnesota's is over $2 per milliliter. So we've got a lot of broad variation. It's geographic, but we also have variation in the size of these taxes. Most of the taxes are implemented at the state level. We have three exceptions that I just wanna bring front of mind so that we can explain the identification strategy shortly. County taxes in Montgomery County, Maryland and Cook County, Illinois. And then also Chicago has a tax on e-cigarettes. Now, for those of you who don't know, Chicago is in Cook County, Illinois. So the way that we deal with this varies between the monitoring the future data where we have county identifiers and the YRBSS data where we only have state identifiers. In the YRBSS, what we're basically doing is using the taxes at the state level or using a population weighted version of exposure to the tax so that we can account for the fact that there is a large population of Illinois living in Chicago or Cook County. 
For MTS data, we're going to use tax jurisdiction. And what we basically mean by that is the state, unless we're in Illinois or Maryland. And in that case, it's either Montgomery County, Maryland, or the rest of Maryland, Cook County, Illinois, or the rest of Illinois. That's what I mean going forward if I say tax jurisdiction. We're gonna go through the slides and then we'll have a pause after this slide. So I know people are probably um, have questions coming to mind already. The estimation strategy here is a two-way fixed effect analytic strategy. With the monitoring the future data, we're going to adjust by the tax jurisdiction or locality and then by quarter year. For the YRBS, it's state by year. The YRBS doesn't give interview dates. All of the interviews are, however, conducted in the, in the spring semester. We're then going to control for policies that affect tobacco use and use of other substances, including marijuana. So this is everything ranging from cigarette taxes, vape-free air law indices, smoke-free air law indices, cigar taxes, percent of residents living in areas with tobacco 21, and then further many, many others, but also um, indicators for state medical and recreational marijuana laws, beer tax, and then economic climate indicators. Those will be by county for MTF and by state for the YRBSS. And then also we've got controls for respondent sociodemographics. The standard errors here are clustered by state and we had to reweight everything because remember we took two different YARBIS surveys, the national and the state ones, and we pulled those data. So we've reweighted them to be representative at the state by age, by gender, by race, ethnicity, so that we can compare across the two surveys. However, we also will run the analyses unweighted, which I'm not gonna be able to show you here, but we have that in the appendix and the findings are fairly consistent. Um, these are OLS analyses because we want to make sure that we're avoiding attenuation bias in nonlinear models with large numbers of fixed effects. And I'm going to pause here for questions. Great. Uh, thank you, Abby. Uh, let me ask if our discussant C has any uh, questions at this stage. Yes, uh, that was fantastic, Abby. Um, I have two questions here. Uh, the first one is about uh, the uh, methodology to calculate taxes for states that uh, impose taxes based on prices, for example, based on either wholesale prices or uh, sales prices. Mm -hmm. So one concern that we always hear about is that if we base anything on Nielsen data, then we are missing the vape shops, uh, the market shares that are uh, from the vape, vape shop online sales. So do you have any concerns of overestimating tax rates in those states that levy taxes uh, based on wholesale prices? So what we did to address this concern is we actually run a sensitivity check, I was gonna mention later, where we instrument for the standardized tax rate with the actual taxes, including by different types because of that concern that perhaps there's something different going on that we're not capturing or we're overlooking in the standardized tax rate. Thank you. And uh, another question that I have is regarding, you know, as an economist, we know it's important to answer the question whether e-cigarettes and cigarettes are complements or substitutes. That's very crucial. But we also know that public health literature uh, talks often about the gateway effect, uh, the potential gateway effect of e-cigarettes, meaning that if uh, you started with uh, using e-cigarettes, that may pave the way for them for addiction and even switching to cigarettes at some point. So uh, can you talk a little bit about, you know, when we look at all this different research, uh, is there a way con to consolidate different evidence? And if we find anything from your research, would that inform um, gateway effects or is not related? So and I'm going to go off script here, so hope I don't know if my co-authors all agree with me on this, but the idea of a gateway effect has gotten a lot of oxygen, but there's a competing hypothesis called common liability. And the idea with common liability is basically that people have underlying predispositions to certain risky behaviors, and that that might manifest as a gateway effect if, for example, in econ speak, you try what you perceive to be the lowest risk product first. And that generates the exact same pattern of use you would expect from a gateway effect. The other thing I would wanna note here is that the concept of a gateway effect originally was not talking about two products with the same addictive substance. It was talking about moving from you know, nicotine to cannabis or something like that. It's not clear that it's the right term to think about movement between combustible versus um, electronic nicotine products because it's the same addictive substance, right? So. I'm not, I'm not saying that there isn't some kind of movement happening there that, that's interesting and that we should know about, but I think the two things that we really need to think about are one, 
can we actually distinguish gateway and common liability if we're really clear on what the distinctions between those are theoretically in the data we have? And I think for the most part, a lot of the papers that claim to show gateway effects could be explained by common liability. Um, and then the next question is, is, is that even the right way for us to use this? Do we need to change our conceptualization of movement between products with different health um, implications if we're gonna talk about products that all have the same addictive component? Because it does seem, if you read the papers, the early gateway effects papers, where they're talking about, you know, if it's marijuana to, co or excuse me, marijuana to cocaine, that's a fundamentally different shift in behavior than e-cigarettes to conventional cigarettes and back because you're just dealing with different addiction substances that work differently on your brain. I'm not sure if that answered the question. <laughs> Thank you. I just feel, you know, there is a, a big debate going on and I'm trying to kind of think about uh, whether this paper that you're doing, which is fantastic, can uh, add to any clar clarities about, <laughs> you know, the biggest debates in the public health regarding um, uh, gateway effect versus common liability. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, I have no questions. Okay, thanks, C. Um, so maybe I'll just, I think Mike's doing a good job of answering questions in the chat. I would just add one other. Um, cigarette uh, prevalence is quite rare, it looks like from that stacked line plot that you showed use by mm -hmm. tobacco type. And I'm wondering um, how that might play into statistical power in terms of your analyses and uh, if that's at all a concern. Yeah, and I'm just going back to that picture so people, I, I don't know if you can see it, but um, so I'm, you know, I'm less concerned about that playing into our analyses because what you'll see is we'll actually give you the mean levels of these behaviors when we look at the analysis, you know, there might be power concerns there. Um, we see statistically significant effects, so I'm not as, as worried about the power concerns. I do think that there is room for and needs to be more work looking at subgroups of people who are still using these products and what they move between instead of treating it as an average population effect where we include the 75% of kids that aren't using anything. Because I think that these groups are probably fundamentally different, maybe in unobservable ways. And we need to think really, really carefully about whether our analysis is informing what we think it is, right? We're, we're seeing a lot of policy arguments that are about you know all of the kids are at risk. But that's, that's not actually what the data say. However, I do think it's worth noting also that this gray area is multi-product use. And a lot of the multi-product users are using combinations of these products. So it's not that this is all of the combustible product use that's happening. There is combustible product use happening in here. Great, okay. Um, well, feel free to continue with your uh, talk. Okay, let me get us back to where we were. All right. Nope. I've got the Q and A now in your way, hold on. <laughs> okay, can we see the first table? Yes. Awesome. Um, I keep giving you all a thumbs up because that's what I do with my room full of microeconomics students. So if I fall into that, forgive me. So this is the good stuff. The first set of results, these are the estimates from the regressions assessing policy effects on ends use. So the outcome is electronic nicotine delivery systems here, a few different ways. You'll note that the first four columns are monitoring the future data. That's these guys. And then the youth risk behavior surveillance system data is here. And before I talk about the point estimates, I just wanna point out two things to think about about these data. First, and this is related to what Justin said, the monitoring the future, future data is smaller in sample size than the youth risk behavior surveillance system data. It's about a quarter of the size. The monitoring the future data is also secondly younger. Remember there are eighth graders in that sample. So if we look at means of the outcome variables, they're smaller in this group than they are here. They're about a third the size current ends use versus in Yarbus versus um, MTF or MTF versus Yarbus. So what this means is we may see variation in statistical significance that's related to power, right? So what we have here are results that are fairly consistent with the prior that we would see substitution in that ends taxes are associated with decreases in ends use, both marginally significant in MTF, a 1.9 percentage point drop for a $1 increase in the ends tax, that is $1 per milliliter, versus highly significant in Yarbis, where we have a 7.1 percentage point drop. Now, I wouldn't compare one-to-one -one those sizes because we might expect different size effects in the younger sample than the older sample. Also, critically, we see this 
um, estimate of a 5.2 percentage point drop in ever use of ENDS. So remember, we're looking at data over time. So this ever use of ENDS, as it's changing across the state over time, should reflect changes in initiation. Whether you mean initiation as in regular use or experimental use, that's a different question. But what we have here is evidence that not only are these taxes reducing use of ENDS, but they're also reducing initiation. In terms of conventional cigarette taxes, we don't have a strong evidence here. The one where we've got a marginally significant effect is on regular ENDS use in the MTF. And that's you know on the margin. So a $1 increase in cigarette taxes is linked to a 0.9 percentage point increase in regular ends use. It's implying a fairly large elasticity, but it's hard to draw conclusions with those kind of marginal effects. I wanted to show you really quickly some heterogeneity in this. So these figures are breaking down those point estimates for ends taxes effects on the outcome and title by different subgroups. And what you'll see here is that the vaping response to the ends tax is driven largely by these older kids, which makes a lot of sense. That may also explain why the point estimates are less statistically significant for MTF because those kids are on average younger. We're also seeing some evidence that females are more responsive to the tax than male students, but it's you know not clearly statistically different. The next table I'm showing you are effects of ENDS taxes on perceived risk and also on sourcing. We'll do perceived risk first, which is from the Monitoring the Future survey. And what this implies is that a $1 per milliliter increase in the ENDS tax rate is associated with a three percentage point increase in the likelihood that you think regular vaping is highly risky. So it's hard to say whether that, how to think about that in terms of causation because there is some evidence that consumption decisions and risk beliefs might be bundled. But it's still worth noting that there is some kind of signal that seems to be happening here, whether it's working through the ENDS tax rate per se or through how the ENDS tax rate affects behavior, that is not so clear. The results on sourcing, I wanna spend a little bit of time on. These are particularly interesting and, and to me, they're actually quite concerning. Note that ENDS taxes are linked to reduced reliance on retail sources and increased reliance on social sources for youth. And to the extent that this reflects greater utilization of informal or illicit market products, it could actually introduce acute health risks. So I'm sure that many of you are thinking evolving. For those of you who um, are not familiar with the term, it's e-cigarette or vaping associated lung injuries, which is the term that was given to the outbreak of vaping related lung injuries in the US in late 2018. The problem with both the outbreak and the term is that this was eventually linked to informally sourced cannabis vaping concentrates, not e-liquids with nicotine alone and not mainstream sourced products. What happened in that context was an additive that was not safe for inhalation was in the cannabis, the illicitly sourced cannabis products or the informally sourced products. And what concerns me when I look at this is the possibility that additives that are not safe for inhalation might be easier to get into the informal market or the illicit market and thus to kids through social sourcing than through mainstream retail sourcing. So personally, when I see that a policy is shifting sourcing among kids for e-liquids, I get very nervous about acute effects that are separate from the general effects we're thinking of nicotine. And what we see here again, consistent to some extent with substitution is that also the cigarette tax rate has the opposite effect. So high cigarette taxes increase retail sourcing for electronic nicotine delivery systems and decrease social sourcing for electronic nicotine delivery systems. So this might make sense in a case where you actually come to the register, you're going to buy your cigarettes and you decide, oh, maybe I'll just switch to e-cigarettes, these are too expensive. And in fact, when we run the heterogeneity analysis here, we actually do see that it is the oldest kids that are driving those point estimates, which is the group that is most likely to be able to get away with purchasing either if they're underage because retailers are not being as careful about underage sales, or if they're actually 18 in a state where Tobacco 21 hadn't yet been put into effect, they could legally purchase. Last big table I'm gonna make you all look at. These are the relationship between taxes and use of combustible tobacco products. First thing you're gonna note here is that our cigarette tax coefficients are uniformly negative 
but they're also uniformly non-significant. This actually is consistent with some recent work suggesting that, East, that excuse me, conventional cigarette taxes may have lost their bite in terms of affecting youth. And indeed, if you look at the coefficients closely, you'll notice that the monitoring the future coefficients are about an order of magnitude smaller than the YRBS coefficients, suggesting that we're seeing even less of an effect in the younger samples, which makes me wonder, of course, if we were to go to older samples, what we would see. Now we can't do that in these data, but probably worth looking at. If we look at the MTF data in terms of ENDS tax rates, we find that the evidence reinforces the prior work's conclusions. A $1 per milliliter tax on ENDS would be associated with a 1.3 percentage point increase in current cigarette use, which is equivalent to an ENDS tax elasticity of 0.12 about for participation. We're also seeing a smaller but more significant coefficient for the effect on current cigarette use of half a pack or more daily. And I wanna note, yes, this number is smaller, the 0 0.006, but the mean is also much smaller. It's actually larger as a proportion of this mean than the comparison for current cigarette use. So it does look like what's going on here has particular bite on the heavier users. And then we only have marginal significance once we start incorporating cigar and particularly little cigar use. When we go to the YRBS, we still have positive coefficients, but they are not statistically significant. Um, my, my first prior about what could be going on here, but I can't verify it, is that we lost a lot of explanatory power without having the county level identification in YRBS, right? So we're using population weighted taxes for Illinois, which means that we are applying a tax rate that's not as exact and the variation isn't as correct as when we actually have each county in Illinois. In terms of the heterogeneity and the smoking response here, again, we're seeing this driven largely by the older youths. In summary for the main results, and I'll get onto sensitivity checks on the next slide, a $1 increase in the ENDS taxes is associated with decreased current ENDS use, two percentage points in MTF, which is the younger sample versus seven percentage points in the YRBSF. Decreases in ever use of ENDS by five percentage points, increases in current cigarette use by one percentage point about with a larger effect um, in terms of percent of the mean for higher intensity forms of cigarette use increased perceptions of risks of e-cigarettes and shifts of end sources away from retail and towards social, particularly for older youth. Now, we have to run a bunch of identification checks here, right? Everyone loves a good two-way fixed effect model, but there are problems. And I'm sure those of you who've been following the literature recently have been hearing more and more about the potential problems. The classic concern with this kind of analysis is policy exogeneity. Did the states or localities that adopted these policies actually adopt them in response to a problem that was pre-existing to higher or lower rates ex ante. So to look at this, we add a one period lead on the tax for as an indicator in our regression. So essentially a binary variable that says the tax one year, that is there a tax one year later on ends. And the coefficients on the lead were small and insignificant and this lead's inclusion didn't affect the contemporaneous tax variable, which is reassuring. The next concern that's in the literature broadly for two-way fixed effects has to do with staggered treatments. Essentially, the concern here is that if we have dynamic treatment effects, that is, if the effect of an intervention such as a tax evolves over time, then an analysis that compares earlier treated units with later treated units will be biased because essentially it'll difference out the change in the um, treatment effect as well as the um, as well as the overall difference. That wasn't very well explained. Um, essentially, the issue here is it's not the same as, as comparing a treatment effect to no treatment. You started comparing a treatment effect to another treatment and they're heterogeneous, so they're not just gonna perfectly different. There are two ways to get at this that we've looked at here. The first is a Goodman-Bacon decomposition. What this tells us is that the problematic comparison of comparing earlier treated or already treated states as a counterfactual for the later treated states actually drives less than 6% of our average treatment effect, which suggests that this is not what's driving our point estimates. But 
just in case, we also ran a staffed difference in difference estimator. The idea here is essentially you have an event window around the tax change and you select controls that are clean, that is controls with no prior tax. And then you run the analysis that way. And that rules out bias from heterogeneous effects. And as expected, we get similar results. I should also note we draw Minnesota there because you have to since it had tax the entire time. Then we run a bunch of other sensitivity checks, which I am not going to show you because we don't have time. We estimate the instrumental variable model I mentioned earlier, where instead of using the standardized tax alone, we use instruments for the standardized tax, specifically the different tax components for e-cigarettes as their instruments. Results are similar. We try controlling for cigar taxes, which is more and more important when you're looking at youth, particularly because of little cigars. Similar. We used a probit model, we dropped our weights, we adjusted standard errors to use wild cluster bootstrap. And then with the MTF, we also tried using the unbalanced panel, adding some extra controls and using an any vaping variable, which instead of the nicotine only vaping. So that has you know the potential to get more accurate responses on any vaping, but it also may reflect some cannabis use. Results are largely similar. There are of course limitations here. The first come from the data. Obviously these samples are run in middle and high schools, which means kids who've dropped out aren't in them. And if kids who tend to drop out of school also tend to engage in other risky behaviors, that means we're going to have some underrepresentation of the true population-wide behavior in our samples. There's also potential reporting bias. This could be either recall bias or social desirability bias, which is always a concern. Um, reassuringly, these are anonymous surveys. And then there's a lack of detailed information on intensity of ends use. And I, um, I wanna say that I, I can't blame anyone for this because I don't have a solution, but we would really like a way to know the difference between the kid who took two puffs off of an e-cigarette, even if he did it every day, and the kid who consumed two pods of an e-cigarette every day. Those are fundamentally different levels of exposure. And right now we don't have great variables for that in these surveys. And then the other point I wanna make is that these products are evolving. The ENDS products that were on the market prior to 2016, as I mentioned earlier, look very different from the ENDS products on the market today. And it's not just um, e-liquid nicotine concentration. For example, the level at which you can heat the product affects the nicotine delivery. So we need to think very carefully about how we do analyses over this full period and whether or not we should be thinking about early analyses as generalizing to later periods, because even if they're well identified, we might be talking about fundamentally different products. Now we deal with that here with having year fixed effects along with the state fixed effects. In terms of policy implications, I'm gonna note two, I'm sure there are a number more, but I think there are two that are front of mind in the US right now. The first is that Congress is currently considering an e-cigarette only tax, roughly proportionate to the federal cigarette tax. This is in the Build Back Better plan. Our monitoring the future results suggests that two in three teens that do not use ENDS due to that tax would use cigarettes instead. And remember that the relative um, health risk estimate that we noted earlier was that ENDS appear to be about two fifths more or less dangerous than um, conventional cigarettes. So just for comparison, the YRBS results suggest even larger reductions in youth current ends use, but it's still a sizable increase at the same time in youth cigarette use. So the problem here is that these increases in smoking are going to considerably undercut or even possibly outweigh the public health gains from reducing youth ends use. The other policy implication that is particularly important has to do with the FDA. Now the FDA doesn't have jurisdiction to actually set taxes. And so most of their funding and most of the research they consider does not focus on taxes. But natural experiments that look at taxes are great approximations to what will happen if you make a product less accessible or less appealing. And consequently, papers like this one provide very useful and valuable information that should be considered by policymakers, not just those who are interested in the specific policy we're studying, but those who are interested in the overall implications of regulations that might make these products easier or less easy to access. In terms of research implications going forward, we need ongoing analyses. Anyone who's taken intro micro knows that when a potential substitute enters a market, you shift the demand curve for the existing products. And I do not believe that this is the last we're gonna see of new nicotine devices. So we need to keep studying these. We need to update our analyses and not take our eye off the ball there. But we also need to start thinking about the supply side. 
because that is going to become more and more important as these markets seem to be differently structured. We've long thought of the tobacco market as an oligopoly and the entry of e-cigarettes does to a large extent change that. So thinking about those implications is going to be important. Also, both in this paper and in at least one of the papers I mentioned earlier, we saw different effects by age. So accounting for age varying responses, especially when we know in the US that while the majority of first cigarette use happens among adolescents, we see first regular use happening a little bit later, 18 to 25 for a lot of kids. So thinking carefully about these ages and how we think about that, for example, 18 to 25 age range where they're not minors, but they're not really adults is going to be important, both for the analyses and the policy implications. And then finally, I'd like to encourage all of us to reject oversimplifications. Um, first of all, as much as many of us for, for decades or more have been studied, studying and wary of the tobacco industry, the health effects of these products do vary. There's argument about how much they vary, but the idea that they vary is not um, particularly in question. So the implications of that need to be thought of carefully for both policy and in our models. And then also the addictiveness and the nicotine delivery varies across products, even within ends. And it's not as simple as the dose that you see on the e-liquid because the delivery depends not just on the dose, it also depends on temperature. So we need to be careful in economic models about homogeneity assumptions, about how we think about the market shifting when close substitutes enter or become less accessible. And then we need more nuanced data because at the end of the day, a lot of these analyses are participation elasticities and the closer we can get to look at the intensity elasticities, the better picture we'll have of the health implications. I'm gonna stop there so we have time to talk, but thank you. Thank you so much, Abby. Um, C, do you have uh, questions? Yeah, uh, that was great. I just have a few clarification questions. Um, so for the analysis for the intentional consequences of e-cigarette taxes, I know you are looking at the measures of e-cigarette use, uh, but we also know that when we look at use, they tend to experiment with multiple substances and multiple products. So is there a way to kind of uh, do a more in-depth analysis about looking at whether uh, the, the use sample in um, a, a using or using several products together or just exclusively using e-cigarettes. So I think that might be an interesting question to look into. Um, you mean dual use or do you mean simultaneously yeah. in the same? Okay, so we're not talking about like blunts, we're talking about dual No, no, no. So did yeah. you look into dual use? Because I don't think I see the results. We didn't look at that here. Mm -hmm. um, I think there there is some it's worth noting that when you're talking about kids, the smoking and vaping questions are for the most part past 30 day any use or number of days. Whereas mm -hmm. when we're talking about dual use in adults, we usually are talking about people who have not only used in the past 30 days, but they've also used a certain amount in their life. So the classic one is at least 100 cigarettes in your life. So we're getting some indication of at least one of these habits is regular when we're talking about dual use for adults. It's a little more complicated with kids because you can't distinguish between the kid who was at a party and tried everything once in the past 30 days and the kid who's using every using one of these products daily. And I think we do need better, better data. Um, the National Youth Tobacco Survey, in theory, has great data on this, but they don't widely release their state identifiers outside of the CDC, which really makes it difficult for us to do analyses that look at that. They also don't include any socio or excuse me, socioeconomic indicators, which I think matters a lot given what we know about SES and these behaviors. So we could, you know, some very minor changes to existing data sets could make it much easier for us to do high quality analyses of that question. Um, my, my second question is about um, how taxes may affect where the use purchase their products. Um, and uh, as you say, you know, the product types change over time. And uh, we saw the evidence showing that uh, young people were switching from power systems or like not, maybe not switching, but there was a, a brief takeoff of the puff bars. So I'm wondering if, you know, the preference of for products uh, that change over time may influence your results by looking at uh, how tax may impact where the youth um, purchase their products. Yeah. So the, the tax standardized indicator we used was based on the 2013 average price, specifically because we wanted to circumvent that concern, endogenous changes in preferences influencing the price variable we were looking at. We also have your fixed effects in there to absorb those general changes. 
that might have um, impacted behavior so that the, the beta that is the coefficient on our ends tax and our cigarette tax variable wouldn't have been driven by that. But I do think those are very important factors to keep in mind when we're looking at these kinds of analyses. And also, I know as we go on and on, we're going to start seeing people comparing analyses that used early data to later data. And sometimes that might make sense, but I think we need to interrogate when that doesn't make sense. Yeah, um, I have one comment rather than question regarding uh, the results where we didn't find any significant impact of cigarette taxes on cigarette smoking, because we all know that the smoking problems have been, has been really very low, so there may not be enough power to detect any significant results, especially when you look at uh, daily smoking problems. Uh, I know Ken Warner has a paper on this that shows the dramatic uh, decrease in uh, daily smoking problems among young population in the US. So, yeah, so I feel, you know, there, there may not be enough power. <laughs> I, think, I think you're right. I also think there's a really important thing to notice about how economists do this. Because we have year fixed effects in there, we're identifying only off the changes in the cigarette tax. And because our analyses only have data from post, I think 2014 is the earliest ends tax we have, where all of our variation is coming after the federal tax increase in 2009. So we're very much more limited in the size of the tax changes. You know, there was a huge one in California, but other than that, um, in that period, and since we're only able to identify off the changes, I do think we're restricted on power. It is also possible that the return to a tax varies across the size of the tax, such that we're not seeing returns as much to a 10 cent tax increase if we're talking about you know, Chicago or New York, which have some of the highest in the nation, we might see a much larger response to that same tax increase in different states, but the analysis isn't set up to detect that kind of heterogeneity. And of course, we're going to be very limited if we're only identifying off the changes in the taxes there. On the upside, those are the, the way that you would identify it if you want a causal estimate. So it's... Yeah, I guess my last clarification question is about uh, how to treat states or localities without any easy grade to access taxes. So did you restrict your sample to states, uh, only states that have easy rate taxes, or are you look into like all states? Uh, and no, we're looking at all states. We're looking at all states. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's good to know, because I was thinking, you know, whether the results may change by looking at the states with only, with both e-cigarette and cigarette taxes versus, you know, yeah. treat uh, c uh, states without e-cigarette taxes at zero. Um, Anyways, great I'm to gonna know. just pull up the figure if people can see it, just so people know what we're talking about. That th this has the taxes that actually were in place in 2019 versus 2020. Yeah, um, yeah, that makes so, a lot of sense. Yeah. Great, um, thank you, Sia. I think um, we have a bunch of questions in the Q and A. Um, so before yeah. we get to that, I, I have one a question of my own. So if I were gonna take a skeptical view of your findings, I would focus probably on the the Yardis. Um, analyses where you show, you know, large effects of ENDS taxes on ENDS use, but no significant effects of ENDS taxes on cigarette use. And there's some imprecision in that estimate. I know you mentioned that it could be about the county level um, uh, variation in, in MTF versus state level in uh, Yarbis, but most of your variation, your policy variation is at the state level with a, only a couple of exceptions. Um, you know, you mentioned that the sample in size in Yarbis is much larger, twice as big as MTF. And so one interpretation could be that, you know, in a more generalizable and older sample, you know, maybe the effect ends tax effect on cigarette smoking is sort of weakens. And I, I guess I'd be curious what, what you would think about that. Yeah. So I want to I want to note something that I should have mentioned at that point in time. I, I, I put the figure up, but let me go back to the tax figures. Um, ends, remember, is biennial. So it's only in the odd year. So we only have 2015, 2017, and 2019 data, or excuse me, not ends, on Yarbis. We only have 20, 2015, 2017, 2019 data on Yarbis, which means, especially because we don't know exactly when they were interviewed also, it drastically reduces our variation. So it's not just that we don't have every year, it's that we don't have the kind of within year variation, and we don't have the kind of regional variation that we'd like to have. With, that we have with MTF when we do with the youth risk behavior surveillance system. I'm, I'm sure I won't be the only person here who feels like what we really need is a burfist for kids, like an annual <laughs> ongoing data collection for this. Um, but I do think the Yarbrus was at a disadvantage for identifying those effects, especially if you look at when, um, can, can you all see the slide I have up? Yeah, we can. 
Yeah. So if you look at when a lot of these policy changes went into effect, the there was a lot of July dates. So for the 2015 ones, which means a lot of the 2015 changes, we weren't going to see any effect on them until 2017 in the Arbus. And same with some of the later changes during the second half of the year. So I think that that Yarbus is at more of a disadvantage to identify this than you might initially think. Yeah, great. Um, there's a question from Jesse King in, uh, who says that considering that social source is so important for youth access, um, she wonders about the relationship between the taxes and youth use. Um, is it that the young adults or adults who are purchasing these products um, are, are passing on the cost to youth or is it that the young adults or adults are, who were providing these products to youth are no longer purchasing them and this is reducing youth access. Do you have any thoughts about this? I can give you my thoughts. I don't have the data to, to be sure about this, but I think the answer is both. Um, I think that you know, basic economic theory tells us that the price will get passed on. So if you raise the price in general, then even if youths have someone else buying in their stead, those people are going to pass that price on, which may affect willingness to pay. So there should be some effect of the price on youth. Um, there also could be other policies going on that might Im um, impact adults' willingness to purchase for youth, including Tobacco 21, which we did control for. Um, so there are, there, there are a lot of things happening in the environment at once. I do think it's worth noting that cigarettes are, are fundamentally different than e-cigarettes in terms of the purchasing patterns. Because with e-cigarettes, you have to buy the device but once you have the device in hand, which you may be able to get off of eBay or various places when people get rid of their old ones because they want a new one, the e-liquid itself is easy to hide, right? You can get a bunch of them and sell them pretty surreptitiously. We know kids are even using them surreptitiously in schools. So it's not something that's very expensive or hard to carry around and distribute informally. Um, and that I think changes how we would think about the dynamics of access. Right, and, and of course there is also the question, and I think this is a real, very real concern, which is the reporting bias issue here. Are we having kids who are staying retail where they get them from a friend and they're just assuming the friend bought it? I mean, what, what qualifies as a social source for a teenager? Um, yeah. And I think we need to know more about that. So Ann Anderson asks, uh, or said, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, combustible cigarette taxes are losing their bite. Um, and, uh, she says, don't, don't we have a greater need to discourage combustibles and how can we do that if the, um, those taxes are no longer um, as effective, if that's the case? Um, so I, um, I should have said more about this. The evidence is that on average, the average treatment effect is losing its bite. That does not mean that raising a cigarette tax in states that have incredibly low combustible cigarette tax won't have an, an effect. It means that on average, the tax effects that we're seeing from the states that have raised their tax are getting to be smaller and smaller in recent years. And this may be because we have a lot of states with really high taxes. So if your tax is already upwards of $5 a pack, adding 25 cents to it is, is not going to disincentivize as many people as the first $5 did. Um, Cause you've gotten to the people have got to the point of the, the um, demand curve where the people are very inelastic, right? Mm -hmm. So, Oh God, I shouldn't explain it that way. You can all tell I've been teaching micro this semester um, to the point of the demand curve where people are going to buy it regardless of how expensive it is. So if you're already up at the $5 tax, you're not going to get much return from an additional increase. But if you're in a state that has say a 20 cent state tax and a $1 federal tax, so a total tax of $1.20 or even of $2, a $1 increase there might have much more bite. So I think we need to start thinking very carefully about heterogeneity separately from the average treatment effects here, because at the end of the day, if you look at a map of tobacco policies in our country and you look at a map of tobacco use, they overlay in the ways you would expect. And there are areas of the country that are much further behind. And they also have the cancer incidence that's consistent with that. So if we wanna you know, improve on a nationwide level, we have to start thinking not just about average national effects and really think about the targeted areas that need intervention. So I think we'll do maybe one or two more questions. So one question is from Alex uh, Lieber who says, what would be the effect of producer price increases as, as opposed to tax increases, but just changes in the, in the prices of products um, on the ability to identify the effect of cigarette taxes on smoking? I think Mike is responding to it right now because oh, it just okay. disappeared. Fair enough, um, okay. The, the microeconomist to me says, uh, if we're asking about what the effect would be, it's equivalent if you're talking about um, implementing a tax, a tax is a tax, right? The thing that determines who bears the burden of the tax is the elasticity of demand, not 
the um, whether it's technically on the producer or technically on the consumer. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I think why, I, why don't can I note one thing, Justin? Yeah. Um, we were debating this beforehand. Ken Warner brought up that the Senate has now taken ah, the yeah, tax you. off the table. We were literally at the beginning of this trying to figure out whether it had been formally removed or not. So thank you, Ken, for for bringing that up. But that is not in you know at least this session's plan. I'm sure it's going to come up again. For those of you who followed it, the original policy was a combustible cigarette tax increase and a federal e-cigarette tax that was equivalent. Um, many, I think, of the researchers here have argued that while there is not necessarily an argument against having some e-cigarette tax, having them equivalent when the products have differential risk doesn't necessarily make public health sense. Um, so I think we can anticipate this coming up again. I don't think this this conversation is over. I think it's just going to be in a different piece of legislation. Great. Xiaoying? We're out of time. Uh, thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 219 people for your participation. Have a top-notch holiday break and new year. Bye-bye.